All right, guys, so today we are going to watch together a documentary from CNBC that speak about battery recycling. If you've been following me for a while, you know that I love recycling and maybe you also know that I'm quite involved in battery recycling on different parts of the supply chain by feeding battery recycler and also by trading the product. So yeah, I'm still in a learning curve, so <laughs> I don't know everything, but uh, I do hope that my commentary are going to be quite interesting and entertaining. All right, so I haven't watched the documentary. I wanted to do it first with you guys. So yeah, let's uh, jump in. This is no ordinary battery facility. Inside are piles of used and faulty EV batteries, many of which will function again. Re-entering electric vehicles after Spears New Technology rebuilds the ones they can and salvages critical minerals from the rest. It's fantastic that you can drive an electric vehicle knowing that the end of the life of that battery pack, the ingredients will be reused in a new battery pack and a new electric car. And that we really want to play a role in. Dozens of electric vehicles are scheduled to debut in 2024, and over 300 million EVs are expected to be on the world's roads by 2030. Tesla, Volvo, and GM are just a few companies leading the way towards electrification. But with any new technology, comes new problems to tackle. If you're going to call yourself a green company, you don't want your batteries piling up in junkyards. <laughs> the volume of recycling is hotly debated right now. There's been billions and billions of dollars of venture capital that's gone into it. The degradation of an EV battery pack is one of the biggest questions of the industry, every battery will reach end of life. And it's important that these end of life packs are recycled so they don't end up where they don't belong. CNBC explores how you... Yeah, because one thing with EVs is that this battery needs to be recycled one way or another because otherwise are they cleaner than a fossil fuel vehicle? Yeah, I mean, the judge is still out. So yeah. Recycling is going to be an extremely important uh, point in the future. And the question is, what are the policy the government are going to put in place to force this recycling? So, <laughs> yeah, anyway. These batteries will play a role in the future of electrification and what one Oklahoma company is doing to help with the millions of used battery packs with nowhere else to go. The American EV market is small in comparison to operations in China and Europe. In 2021, the U.S. accounted for less than 10% of new global EV registrations, while China accounted for 50%, and Europe came in at 35%. When it comes to EV back Yeah, so one thing with China, um, a bunch of mega cities in China are fully electric as we speak. So you go into the street, it's really weird, you know, there's like no sun. It's like only... So... Yeah. Batteries, China accounts for over 70% of global production capacity, leaving the U.S. heavily dependent on imports from battery minerals. The life cycle of an EV battery really starts when minerals are extracted from the earth, and those minerals are used to produce an EV battery cell. The critical minerals that go into EV batteries include lithium, cobalt, manganese, nickel, and graphite. It has been clear since 2014 that China had a plan to lock up the bulk of the world's production of battery minerals. The world's largest battery company is now in China. Now under President Biden's inflation reduction. Yeah, I mean, they are already the biggest cobalt uh, miners by far. So China has already captured the supply chain and it's going to be quite difficult actually to change it because, um, I mean, European and uh, the US, they don't want uh, lithium refinery in the in the cities because it's extremely polluting, so of course they let China do the, the dirty work. Act, EV manufacturers can qualify for a tax credit if 40% of its critical battery minerals are sourced domestically or with a free trade partner like Canada by 2024. This is industrial policy of a sort that we have not seen in this country for a very, very long time. In theory, a certain percentage of the battery minerals has to come from the smallest of countries, the battery, the cell, the processing, all of that has to be done onshore and the car has to be built in the U.S. Sourcing minerals domestically is necessary to keep up with new regulations. But opening mines in the U.S. has been met with opposition from local communities concerned about environmental and health hazards. Yeah, so you can't open new mines <laughs> because of environmental problem. But uh, yeah, we want EVs. Hmm. I I've read an article about one of the biggest copper mines, uh, I mean, one of the biggest 
deposit of copper. It's called the pebble, pebble, ah, I don't remember. But anyway, and it was shut down because of some like birds or lake, whatever, uh, in the US. So, yeah, what do you want? This is why sometimes I feel like humans are like kids. I want my hair pollution to be clean, but uh, no, I don't want to, to dig to get that. So, anyway. Hazards. Recycling and reusing used battery packs is one possible long-term solution. It's very early stages. We're kind of talking about a business that is just forming now and won't really hit its stride, at least in the United States or, or North America, till like 2030, because that's when we'll start to see more and more EVs get to end of life and more and more battery packs. Both public and private commitments suggest that EV production will increase in the U.S., which means more American companies are likely to enter this space of EV battery manufacturing and recycling. Uh, this logo here, I think I've seen 2,000 companies with the same uh, <laughs> infinite round <laughs> instead of two others. Recycling too. Companies like Redwood Materials, Lifecycle, and American Battery Technology have already developed processes. So actually about Lifecycle, I've just seen that they um, signed a 75 million debt convertible with, uh, with Glencore to recycle lithium-ion batteries. We're building the infrastructure for something we expect to exist in several years that isn't really at a big scale yet. If they can get the cost comparable to newly mined materials, the demand will be very significant because nobody really wants to be mining cobalt and nickel more than they have to. There are a number of smaller players now who do this for hybrid batteries and I fully expect them to expand into battery electric vehicle batteries. They're correspondingly more valuable and you can probably make more money servicing a dead battery electric vehicle than a dead hybrid. Repairing, remanufacturing, repurposing, and recycling of EV batteries. That's what's happening here in Oklahoma City at Spears New Technologies. The number of battery packs we have here are in the hundreds. We make sure that they are clean and then they go on the racks to be processed, taking them apart, testing them, building them back together, make sure that they are as good or better than uh, what they replace. And then they go back on the rack again, waiting for uh, a dealer to need one of these. And then we send them out. Dirk Spears is the founder and CEO of Spears New Technologies. His company specializes in the life cycle management of EV battery packs by extending its first life and reducing the need to mine critical minerals. I've been in batteries for almost 15 years now, uh, hence my gray hair. We believe that the world is going electric and we wanted to extend the economic life of those battery packs and help the OEMs with their life cycle management. And we do that all on the one roof, on the one campus. Spears New Technologies, or s and was founded in 2014 with just two employees. In 2021, it was acquired by Cox Automotive, a subsidiary of Atlanta-based media conglomerate Cox Enterprises, which has other automotive brands like Auto Trader and Kelly Blue Book. The company now has over 400 employees and offers what it calls a one-stop solution for use and faults in EV batteries. We are like a diner of battery services. So you can come to us for a cup of coffee, but if you want to have a steak or a cup of soup or apple pie, we serve all these things. S I did not understand the, <laughs> uh, the, the the image. What what <laughs> what did they do? It? <laughs> so yeah, so um, I work with a battery recycler that actually are breaking down the battery and making black mass out of it. Black mass is what is called when the, the, it's a black powder basically and there's like lithium, copper, uh, cobalt and nickel in it. But these guys seems like they, what they do is um, they just enhance the li life, sh shelf life of the battery. Yeah. Maybe they will explain. S&T receives batteries directly from the dealership or original equipment manufacturer. For example, Toyota or Porsche. It then puts these batteries through its diagnosis system named Alfred. Alfred assesses the health of the battery pack to determine whether it eventually can go back into a vehicle. To get there, it can be repaired to operational conditions, remanufactured to original factory standards, or refurbished and upgraded to current factory standards. Otherwise, s and can repurpose it for a second life, usually energy storage. And if the pack is truly at its end of life, s and will recycle it as a last resort. This is a... The result of our mechanical shredding process concludes with byproducts that are captured in these large super sacks here. 
These super sacks contain the byproducts of plastics, aluminum and copper foils, as well as black mass. And that black mass consists of critical minerals, cobalt, magnesium, aluminum, copper, graphite, and of course, lithium. In addition to its headquarters in Oklahoma City, s and has facilities in Las Vegas and Detroit, but plans to expand to the East Coast. It also has operations abroad in the Netherlands and plans to open in the UK soon. But being centrally located in the US is key for its business model. We need to be where our customers are. Being bang in the middle of the country helps. We can reach either coast between two and three days. We can ship by air. So if it really needed to be, we can have a battery pack the next morning by 10 o'clock. s and does not work direct to... But I'm, I'm a bit puzzled right now. CNBC, I mean, do they get money from that company? It seems like this is an ad for, for this company. I mean, uh, Spear Technology, whatever. Uh, <laughs> is it? <laughs> But anyhow, I think what they do is great. I did not know about, uh, that you can really refurbish like a, a battery. And, but it seems weird because the battery chemical um, chemical composition is degraded over the time. So I, I don't know how they do that. Consumer. An EV owner brings their battery pack to a dealership, which then sends it to s and to be serviced. That dealership swaps out the customer's battery with an operational one already in stock. If none are in stock, s and will send the pack from its storage. Meanwhile, s and works on the customer's battery, then stores it to be sent out later. s and also works with battery manufacturers and car makers, which can send faulty batteries to be repaired. The company says its facilities total over 800,000 square feet of production space, and 500,000 of those are for battery storage. It wouldn't disclose the number of battery packs it's capable of storing, but says it handles on average 15,000 battery packs and modules per month. We get anything from, say, 50 to 100 battery packs per day. 80, 90 percent can be refurbished and that it's good enough to go back into a vehicle. Recycling is maybe 5 to 10 percent and the rest is a repurposing second life. But those numbers will fluctuate. Repurposed battery packs can be reused in non-vehicle applications such as energy storage for solar panels and power grids. Because the industry is so new, I think we're squarely focused on providing end-to-end -end life cycle management for every battery that comes to our operation. Since its inception, s and says it's serviced more than 240,000 packs and more than 50,000 have been repaired, refurbished or remanufactured. But I, I still don't get it. Who paid them? Why? How? I mean, how? <laughs> It's recycled 3,000 packs. If you look at the EV market, and if you take Tesla out, we probably have 60, 65, 70% of that market of the non-Tesla electric vehicle uh, OEMs. So that's a lot. GM, Ford, Stellantis, Porsche, Volkswagen, Nissan, Toyota, Volvo. We keep adding to the list. And when asked why they don't work with one of the most recognizable brands in the EV industry? No, they always do. Their, they like to do their own stuff. Uh, you know, they're a little bit like Apple. And also they're, and maybe this is not politically correct, their payment terms are like really bad. So. <laughs> I think we owe, the industry owes a lot to Tesla. Uh, they made electrification sexy. When I think about the future of EV battery recycling specifically, I see it as an increasingly competitive space. But at the same time, there's a bit of a mismatch of maybe more supply and capacity around EV battery recycling than demand because we're just riding this first wave of electric vehicles who, who could be on the road for 10 plus years. The lifetime for an EV battery is estimated to be 12 to 15 years in moderate climates. However, the estimated reuse lifetime of an EV battery can range anywhere from 5 to 30 years. By 2050, the demand for graphite, lithium, and cobalt is expected to increase by 500%. Okay, so uh, just a uh, quick a piece of advice. When you have like this type of um, <laughs> figures by the National Renewable Energy Laboratory or by any other I mean, kind of people that do projection for like 2030, 2050. This is full. <laughs> they don't.
no man. maybe it's going to be an exponential you know maybe there is going to be more and more demand for it or maybe not it will just stop because down the line we'll see that people prefer to have like um, a fossil fuel vehicles and i don't know in five to ten years people have realized that it's more expensive electricity than fossil fuel and most of the europeans and maybe americans are going to be way poorer than what they are now they'll say to that uh, we want the cheapest or maybe there's going to be a new revolution in batteries and then we don't know so but extending the life of an EV battery can reduce the need for critical minerals. So could battery refurbishment become a big business and how profitable is it right now? A couple of years ago, there was a cost associated with recycling a lithium ion battery pack. Now it is a positive. If you give me a lithium ion battery pack, I probably will give you money back for it. And that's the beauty of it. The intrinsic value of that battery pack is higher than the cost of recycling. The world has a finite amount of minerals. Okay, so now now it makes sense. But this is exactly what I've seen also with others, uh, all the other recyclers. But I don't know about this specific company. But man, uh, there is also a lot of subsidy just to make them work profitably. And especially right now, the price of lithium for the recyclers. I mean, the price of lithium is so low compared to what it used to be a couple of years ago. That I don't know how they're if, if they could be profitable without like all the taxpayer subsidy. I don't know. Necessary for EV batteries. It's hard not to speculate. Could indefinite recycling and reuse be the future? Absolutely. The circular economy is happening. It's happening right now. It's happening here in Oklahoma City. Why would you get cobalt from Africa or lithium from South America if you can get it here in Oklahoma City? Critical minerals will always be reused. And it's already happening, but the, the, the volume is still small. But it will get bigger and bigger. I think we will be mining metals for the balance of my lifetime but indeed, the hope is as batteries get more powerful, smaller, lighter, and cheaper, with luck, we will need fewer metals. We could get to the point where maybe a significant majority of battery materials are recycled from old batteries, but we need to hit critical mass on EV penetration for us. There just aren't enough EVs out there yet, but maybe 10 or 20 years from now. Yes, because for all, uh, this is completely true. We need to have like, some type of critical mass. And I'm speaking about uh, a supply chain perspective, you know. It's very difficult to um, to recycle product that there, there is no enough density, or the value is so low that people don't really care. Here we have like one, good thing for the batteries especially the EV batteries I mean the value is quite high of those battery packs so it makes sense to ship it to Oklahoma and so on so uh, it's making economical sense but um, the more density the more EV batteries we have the easier it's going to to be to recycle them the more uh, economy of scale the recycler are going to get so um, yeah it exactly it will make more sense think of recycling as like mining you know if you need to mine like a huge surface and there's like only few grams of any uh, minerals in this huge surface it's not economical but if you know that there is like a good vein with like high density of uh, minerals you, you are going to mine here so it's a bit the same with, uh, with recycling you need to make sure that there's like enough product to be recycled in a specific area so then the cost of transport and the cost of logistics doesn't just eat up all the uh, or the margin that recycling could make. Oh, there could be. Some critics believe the EV battery recycling business could be booming too quickly, and that the current capacity outpaces demand for this service, at a time when most EV batteries have yet to reach the end of life. The idea, I think, that battery recycling has boomed too soon or peaked too soon feels very short-sighted to me. It's important to point out here that the auto industry works on five to seven year product cycles. The cars through 2025 are already locked down. When we started, everyone thought that we were nuts, and we were, but we made the right call on the market. We didn't get carried away. We didn't have a lot of money to waste. We always had a focus on making the business work and make it profitable, and that's what we did. While ST is one of the pioneers of this space, like-minded companies like American Battery Technology are not far behind developing new ways to domestically source metals. We're building in anticipation. I don't know if it's boomed too soon. This is all new. It is an emerging space. We are all figuring out together how to do it. Some ideas will be winners, some ideas will be losers. Some businesses will be winners, some businesses will be losers. But progress is happening very rapidly. Iteration is happening very rapidly. I'm not sure that was a good deck for Terry. I don't, I don't really, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what do you think of it. Um, yeah. Anyway, ciao.